Hello. Today, I'm going to talk about the conditions of rigidity. Uh, apologies if you can't see me. Um, my, my computer recording setup has had to be slightly Rube Goldberg together. Um, but the important thing is what I say and what you can see, hopefully, on the screen that I'm sharing. So the talk's going to go like this. Um, I'm going to speak for about half an hour because I, I, I'm online, pre-recorded, so I, I can't take questions. I'll take up the whole time with the talk. This gives me a slightly longer talk. Um, the talk's going to go like this. We're going to discuss uh, what rigidity is and why am I care. I'm going to explain what the point of this talk is, which is to succeed where others have failed, as, as all great philosophy talks are. right? Um, I'll say how I'm going to do this. I'll give my account um, in section four of six. And then I'll explain how my account extends the non-designators and how it applies over time. Uh, the, the relevance of these last two sections will become obvious as the talk progresses, but these, these are the kind of demonstrations of success of the, the account that will emerge over, over the preceding four sections. So, rigidity. Rigidity is a property of some terms, not all terms. So, sorry, just mute my phone here. Stop myself being distracted. Excellent. Rigidity is a property of some terms, but not all terms. So here's the paradigm case. Um, designators, some designators are rigid and some designators are not. Designators are terms which designate or denote or refer to a thing. So proper names are designators, right? Hugo Hegren, and Joe Biden, I'm Hugo. Joe Biden, the current president. Um, these terms refer to me and Joe Biden, respectively. Definite descriptions are also designators. So the president of the United States picks out at the moment Joe Biden, perhaps in the future Joe Biden, perhaps in the future somebody else. Certainly in the recent past, it's picked out other people, Trump and Obama. The shortest spy picks out somebody, although we don't know who, because they're a spy. Um, these are the two paradigm cases of designators, but like plausibly, I'm not going to dwell on this much, but plausibly there are others, pronouns, um, anaphoric pronouns, demonstratives, um, indefinite descriptions, there are you know, other, other ways of getting at things. But we'll, we'll concentrate on these paradigm cases for now, proper names and definite descriptions. Okay, that's the first step. Um, the second step for rigidity is modal language. So rigidity is generally understood as a, as a property of terms concerned with their modal behavior or their behavior in, in the context of modal sentences. So here's a, a very simple analysis of some modal terms. For those who are unaware, like the, we're going to talk in possible world, terms of possible worlds, and um, don't build too much into the idea of a possible world. A possible world is just a way that history could have gone or way that the world could be. The actual world is one among the possible worlds. It, it's in a sense special because it's actual, right? Um, but a possible world is just like a way that history could have gone. So where phi is a sentence, when we say necessarily phi, we mean in all possible worlds, phi. Okay. So the idea here is however history could have gone, whatever else could have happened, phi would be true. And that's what it means to say necessarily phi, okay? So necessarily two and two is four. Similarly, however else the world went, however, however the world went you know, at all, two and two would be four, right? Conversely, possibly phi means in some possible world phi, but not necessarily in all of them. So yeah, you know, possibly um, Hugo gives a talk about philosophy. Well, well clearly, right? Because in, in some possible world, that's true. Indeed, it's, it's true in, in the actual world, right? Um, but not it's not necessarily true because there are worlds where I didn't go into philosophy at all. Instead, I ran away to join the circus and I don't give a talk about philosophy. So Hugo gives a talk about philosophy is possibly true, but not necessarily true because it's true in some possible worlds, but not all. This analysis in terms of possible worlds would be very important. Right. A rigid designator designates the same thing whichever world is being discussed. This is the, the intuitive idea. So here are some simple glosses on this. If you're, if you're not immediately okay with this, 
don't worry, we're going to come to a, a, a more comprehensive understanding in a minute. Necessarily, Joe Biden is mayor. That's true. Necessarily, Joe Biden is the president. False. In a world where Hillary won the last election, Joe Biden will be a man. True. These work this way because whatever world we discuss, the term Joe Biden picks out the same person. So yeah, if I if I talk about some world where um, Joe Biden exists but isn't the president, where he, yeah, he went off to run away to join the circus or he becomes an artist or something, even though Joe Biden has many other characteristics in the world that I discuss, still my use of the name Joe Biden picks out Joe Biden, right? Um, most people think that it's it's probably the case that wherever Joe Biden exists, he's a man. Um, some people think the first sentence is false, but we'll, we'll put this aside for the moment, right? Um, clearly, the second sentence is false. Um, there are there are worlds where Joe Biden, person Joe Biden, is not the president, um, and clearly the the third sentence is true, just if the first one is true. Okay. So the the import of this slide is that proper names like Joe Biden are rigid. Whichever world we discuss, I pick out the same person in that world when I use the name Joe Biden. And this is true of all names, right? Hugo Hegren, Hillary Clinton. This is a feature of names. So this is a property, as I said before, of some terms. Proper names. Unlike proper names, definite descriptions are not rigid. Necessarily, the President of the United States is a man. False. So, when we say necessarily, we quantify over all possible worlds. We use this designator, the President of the United States. Um, and we say that you know, in any possible world, the President of the United States is a man. But there are some possible worlds where Hillary Clinton won an election, perhaps the last election. So there are some possible worlds where the President of the United States is a woman. So it's false, right? So what's interesting about this is that although in the actual world, the President of the United States is a man, the, it, sorry, in the actual world, the, the term the President of the United States picks out a man. When we use the same term to discuss other possible worlds, i.e. when we use it under the necessarily operator, it picks out other people. And that, that's brought out in this sentence by the fact that those people are not men. But the point, the point is just that when we use the term under the necessity operator to discuss other possible worlds, we pick out other individuals, those people who are not identical with the person who is the referent of the President of the United States in the actual world. Okay. Rigidity comes in flavors. There are two important flavors. The jure rigidity, or the euro rigidity, if you're very careful. The euro rigid designators. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, bless me. The euro rigid designators are rigid by nature. These designators are, are, are rigid, like, because of the type of thing they are. Just, just terms of this type just are rigid, right? So proper names. Um, Joe Biden, as, as we saw two slides ago, and two as a name for the number two. Uh, it's been pointed out to me that some people don't believe that there are mathematical objects with names, or they believe there are mathematical objects, but they don't have names. Um, if, you, if you don't like the mathematical examples, just ignore them. They're, they're clear and nice and easy to use if you're a Platonist, and if you're not a Platonist, they're, they're all just like straightforwardly false. Um, I'm not a Platonist, but it, 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 this makes it easier. So I, yeah, just I'm aware of this. So de jure rigidity, um, rigid by nature. Some, some kinds of term are just rigid, right? De facto rigidity, um, De facto rigid designators just happen to designate the same thing in all possible worlds. But this is not because they're a type of thing that by nature must designate the same thing in all possible worlds. Rather, they just do, right? So consider the even prime. The phrase the even prime designates the same objects in all possible worlds, but not because um, the phrase the even prime has, has some built-in structural rig rigidness to it, rather because the thing which in each world is even and prime is the same thing, right? It's number two. Okay. Um, I should probably speed up about 10 minutes in. So, the goal. 
Everyone will agree that proper names of rigid designators and definite descriptions are not. What about the rest of language? Especially non-designators, kind terms, logical particles, verbs, etc., but especially kind terms. Kind terms are the most widely discussed, um, and various attempts have been made to extend the notion of rigidity towards kind terms. Two questions arise. One, are there good notions of rigidity for linguistic devices other than designators? So does, does it even make sense to talk about rigidity for these things, right? Clearly, it doesn't make sense to talk about the rigidity of, say, pianos or, you know, tigers, right? These things are rigid or non-rigid in a physical sense, um, but this kind of linguistic rigidity just, just fails to apply, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's a non-sequitur. Um, clearly, the notion does apply to things like designators. So the question arises, what about sort of things in the middle, right? What about things like kind terms? Second question then, supposing it does, right? Suppose there are useful notions of rigidity for non-designators, which among the non-designators are rigid? So not all the designators are rigid, the proper names are, definite descriptions are generally not. Suppose that the kind terms were rigid, and it could be rigid, like which among the kind terms, which among the general terms? Um, and similarly for other kinds of language, right? Suppose that there was a notion of rigidity for logical particles, which among the logical particles would be rigid? Okay. Now, previous accounts have, here's a list, previous accounts have generally assumed an answer to either question one or question two, and then built up an answer to the other question. So, Soames, Schwartz, and Devitt listed here all assume which terms um, would be, if there is a good notion of rigidity, would be rigid or non rigid, um, were we to extend rigidity to other kinds of terms. And then they they say, well, this uh, yeah this this distribution of rigidity is unacceptable. They all have slightly different reasons and slightly different supposed distributions. But they all say, well, this is unacceptable. So any any such extension must be unacceptable, right? But this this seems to me to put the cart before the horse, right? Surely, surely, here we go. We should answer one and two separately. Why 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 begin with a notion of the distribution of rigidity and and work backwards to whether this rigidity can be extended to non-designators at all, right? Uh, a brief a brief clarification, sometimes this move that, that Devon Schwartz and Soames make is justified by an appeal to, to some notion of what rigidity is for. So Devon continues from the previous slide, rigidity was supposed to extinguish natural kind terms from these non-natural ones. Uh, this is just false. Um, so the original notion of rigidity developed uh, by Ruth Barker Marcus, and then made famous by Kripke, as we'll see in a minute, applied only to singular terms. So it seems to me that how it should be extended is first off be up for grabs. This approach that Debit supposes uh, seems to me dissimilar to the paradigm case. So the essential difference between names and definite descriptions is not rigidity. The essential difference is a, look, well, you know, I'm not going to offer a theory of names or, or descriptions, but like clearly there are other differences, right? And we we can distinguish the names from the descriptions without appeal to rigidity. And then we notice empirically that the names are rigid and the descriptions are not mostly, right? But this, this seems to me a, a post-fact matter, right? We, we've already had the distinction. Um, in, his, in his strategy at the top of the slide, Devitt wants to go the opposite way. He wants to say, well, well you know, apparently we don't have a distinction. Let's assume that the naturals will be rigid and the non-naturals won't, um, and thus, arrive at a distinction but that's not what was going on in the paradigm case so you know it, it seems to me very non-obvious that this is how we should proceed in this extended case uh, similarly Kripke's 1980 thesis as this is naming necessity um where where he proposes an extension to natural kind terms his thesis is that natural kind terms are rigid not that rigidity is supposed to distinguish natural kind terms from the others Right. He, he, he begins with a, a list of things that he believes are natural kind terms, and a list of things that he believes not. And he he says, look and see the naturals are rigid and the non naturals are not. Now, I, I disagree with Kripke, but the point here is that Kripke's dialectical move is not the one that Devitt supposes it is. So this this is just a brief clarification. Right. Um, the, the move that I'm criticizing Soames and Schwartz and, and Devitt for making is sometimes justified. By, by this kind of an appeal. And I think this appeal is wrong. This is why. Okay, so here's where we've got to. 
Virginity is a, a property of some terms. Um, it seems that some kinds of term definitely have rigid or non-rigid properties. Some kinds of thing definitely don't, like pianos. Question, the first question we're faced with is whether there's a useful distinction of the rigid and the non-rigid for linguistic devices other than designators, such as kind terms. The second question is, well, if so, which among those devices are rigid? My goal is to produce a theory that does not assume answers to one or two, that answers or enables us to answer both, and that distinguishes de jure from de facto rigidity. Remember the distinction from before. Ideally, it would be nice to be able to define de facto rigidity in terms of de jure rigidity. This is a very common move, right? People say de facto rigid designators behave like de jure rigid designators, but and, and go, go on to characterize the sense in which they are not de jure rigid designators. All right, so the strategy. The strategy is to begin with the paradigms. Everyone agrees on the paradigms. Proper names of de jure rigid, modulo some simplifying assumptions about ambiguity, polysemy, and the same name designating different people, which we will conveniently put aside. Um, and different descriptions are not usually rigid. Um, again, modulo some considerations. Some are, if they're constructed correctly, i.e. You know, the actual dot, 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 um, these are called rigidified descriptions, or if they are de facto rigid, like um, the even prime. But everyone will agree on these paradigms. So the strategy is to explain the paradigm cases, but without reference to other kinds of expression, like kind terms, and to do so in an extensible way, and then generalize ideally without any assumptions about one or two. I will argue that the jury de facto distinction can be explained by which facts fix the designation of designator, that a similar fact-based account can be given of at least some other linguistic devices, including kind terms, this is an answer to one, and that among those kind terms, the vast majority are rigid, with a few exceptions, this is an answer to two. The exceptions will turn out to be surprising. Um, as far as I'm aware, the kind of account that I give hasn't been given before. Um, here's some foreshadowing. The exceptions are going to be things like being rare or being... Um, commonly believed. What, what drives non-rigidity for kind terms is going to be the commonality of instantiation. Here's the account. So let's start with Kripke's picture. Um, it's worth saying that Kripke didn't invent the notion of rigidity, but he's, he has certainly gone down history as the, the origination of this idea, and his picture is the most widely cited and, in some ways, the most perspicuous. So he says, let's call something a rigid designator if in every possible world, it designates the same object, a non-rigid or accidental designator, if not. Let's clean this up a bit because this is a bit messy and um, people have, have wondered about this quite a lot. Uh, this is the cleaned up picture that I, I pointed to earlier. I'm gonna use some terms throughout. D is always gonna be a designator. W is gonna be the world which we are discussing. So remember when we when we talk about necessity, we quantifiable worlds, right? Many, many worlds apart from our own. And at is the world where the discussion happens. That's always the actual world. The designated D is rigid, if and only if, whichever world W is, a whichever world is discussed, the object D designates is the same as the object it designates when used to discuss at the actual world, right? The world where D is uttered. Or in other words, it is the same as the object D designates when the world under discussion is the actual world. So taking that this is Kripke's picture, um, my version is just slightly cleaned up. Uh, I've always taken something of an issue with the in possible world um, notation or way of speaking, because it's, it's worth finding quite confusing. And I think it's really important to distinguish sharply in discussion of agency between the world that we are in, right? The, the world where we, where we utter and the world which we discuss, right? Um, I think, some ways of talking make this distinction confused. Facts. So the cleaned up picture is good. Right, this is the cleaned up picture. The cleaned up picture is good, but it doesn't answer many of our goals. It doesn't distinguish the facto and de jure rigidity, and it's designator specific. Both problems can be fixed by appeal to facts. Recall possible worlds. Recall that I said, don't make much of possible worlds, right? Don't, don't, don't build too much into the metaphysics of what a possible world is supposed to be. 
It's just meant to be a way history could go. We're going to be slightly more committed now. Possible worlds can be specified in terms of facts. Now, again, this is not a metaphysical claim. I'm not claiming that there are these things, facts, which constitute a world. Rather, I'm claiming that there are like semantic, well, yeah, semantic things, facts or states of affairs or things that are the case, um, and that a possible world can be specified by some probably maximal consistent set of facts. Something like this is a very common view of possible worlds. Certainly, it's a very common view of the form formalism of possible worlds, which is largely what's the issue here. But I'd like to stress, this is not a metaphysical claim. My, my discussion of rigidity requires li little, if any, metaphysics, right? Um, all, all we really need here is the idea that possible worlds specified or specifiable in terms of facts, which is some sort of semantic entity, can be used to analyze modality. But we need to make no claims about the metaphysics. The idea is just that things are different in different possible worlds. Great. That's strange. Well, OK. So de facto rigid designators designate the same thing in every world, because that thing uniquely has some property or properties in every world. And they just designate whatever has that property. Most or all de facto rigid designators are descriptions. So recall the example from earlier. The even prime is a de facto rigid designator, right? So it's a definite description. It designates two, whichever world is under discussion, because in any world, two is even and is prime, and nothing except two is both. Notice that these are facts about various different worlds, right? In, in my example, we, we say in each world, two is even and two is prime, right? What is the issue is not whether two is even and prime in the actual world, that, that it is. It's whether it's even and prime in each and every world under discussion, each separably from all the others, right? Now, because two is a necessary existent and it has the same properties in every world, um, or, or most of the same properties, perhaps not all the same relational properties, um, has all the same intrinsic properties in every world, um, this is going to be true of it in every world, right? But these are facts about various different worlds. Another way of looking at this is that if you uh, if you were to specify each possible world as a set of facts, right, and you could you could have the same fact in in more than one set, the the fact that two is even and the fact that two is prime and the fact that nothing except two is both would show up in every set, right? But they would show up more than once, once in each set. Okay, so here's the idea: um, de facto rigidity is at least partly explained by facts about the worlds under discussion. Okay. This is an important contrast to de jure rigidity. So here's a quote from Sainsbury's book, Reference Without Reference. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, Zoom's giving me a warning. Um, that's fine. Here's a quote from Mark Sainsbury's great book, Reference Without Reference. He says, the intuitive idea of rigidity is that actual designation is projected onto all worlds, though not for de facto rigidity, as above. Uh, this, is, this is not a problem, by the way. Most people think that de jure rigidity is meant to be the, the kind of intuitive part, and de facto rigidity is a, a, a less obvious cousin, right? Um, so, de jure rigidity. In de jure rigidity, the actual designation is projected onto other worlds. But notice that the actual designation is fixed, always and only, by facts about the actual world. Right? These are going to be facts about our linguistic conventions, facts about dubbings, facts about you know, what objects bear what names in the actual world. And no other facts, in particular no facts about the world under discussion, will fix the reference. So we seem to have a useful contrast between de jure and de facto rigidity. Um, just a, a brief clarification that I don't have a whole slide on. Um, I've been asked before when I've given this talk about um, whether these kinds of facts, the, the, the ones on the, on the slide now, also apply to de facto rigidity. And the answer is yes, of course, right? Um, the reference of uh, an utterance of, of the, the phrase, the even prime is gonna be fixed in part by like linguistic conventions in the actual world. 
conventions li linking words like prime with you know, the property of being prime. Um, the, the point is that the de facto rigidity, as well as these, facts about various other worlds under discussion enter the picture. Whereas for de jure rigidity, no other facts enter the picture. This is the distinction. Right? Only the facts now on the slide enter um, the, the reference fixing for de jure rigidity. That's the important part. So to be rigid is to designate the same thing whichever world is discussed. To be jure rigid is to have the same, um, is, to, is, is to be rigid and for the sameness to be a result of projecting the one actual designated thing onto other worlds, actual designation being determined only by facts about the world of utterance, to be de facto rigid is for the sameness of designation to be a coincidence between the objects determined in the different worlds. Each determination is local to that world because all the unique there is of some one property. Designation is partly determined by facts about the world's discussion. Um, here's a more formal presentation, which I'll put up briefly and then skip over because I'm slightly running out of time. So here's the extension to non-rigid designators. We've got a facts-based theory of rigidity. We distinct, we've distinguished the facto from the jury rigidity. We've made no assumptions so far about one or two. And this section, I'm going to argue for answers. So what else would be fixed? Notice that rigidity is a, is, is a notion of fixing across possible worlds, right? And um, if there was rigidity for other kinds, then rigidity for that kind would be a matter of what fixes something for that kind. So what, right, for, for a designator, it's the designation that's fixed. What would you fix for general terms or for logical terms? Soames, for example, rejects any account of rigidity for kind terms on the basis that it just isn't clear what should be fixed. I agree. Um, notice that designators are just those linguistic devices which designate. So it's clear that what must be held fixed is their designation. Notice that the class of designators is defined by its function. So plausibly, good notions of rigidity can only be described for things which are defined by their function. Kind terms are not defined by their function. Um, kind terms themselves aren't functionally defined, so we shouldn't expect a good notion of rigidity for them all. Uh, this is like a pretty common refrain. There's no obvious way of uniting all kind terms under a single functional profile. However, Kind terms can be used as predicates or as predicators. That is a tiger, that's a typo, sorry. That is a tiger, I am a man, etc. So suppose that we pick a function with respect to which we will define the notion of rigidity, and then we can define a notion of rigid, pre rigid predication for kind terms. So we have a new question, right? Are kind terms rigid predicators? An answer, Mostly yes, including non-natural terms, but not all. Uh, strange. Okay. So here's what I might say about water. Water is a kind term. What it takes to be water is fixed only by facts about the world of utterance. How we use the term water, what we apply it to, etc. So we're going to say that water is a digital rigid predicator. Most kind terms are like this. Indeed, almost all kind terms are like this, right? Including non-natural kind terms. Um, this is a, an unusual claim to make in the, the literature on rigid kind terms. So cat, computer, and celebrity all work in this way. Or would it be um, to be a non de jure rigid predicator? Well, let's try to find uh, a kind term or predicator such that what it takes to fulfill it is not fixed only by facts about the world of utterance. I think that the only things that have this profile are predicates which appeal to facts about the world where they are evaluated, being common, being rare on objects in that world, being widely believed by the people of that world, being the shortest within that world, being the largest. Notice that all these predicates are predicates of comparison or super Super, superlative, sup, superlation? The, the, the comparatives are superlatives, right? Uh, what it takes to, to fulfill these predicates, what it takes to be a member of the kind, if there is such a kind, um, 
depends upon the distribution of properties among objects other than the one discussed or the, the ones discussed, right? In the world under discussion. So recall that the de jure rigid designators had their reference. Um, of course, that was for designators. In this case, we're not talking about reference. They had their reference fixed only by facts about the world of utterance. But here we have predicates whose applicability is fixed not only by facts about the world of utterance, but also by general facts about the world or worlds under discussion. These, if any, are the non de jure rigid predicates or all kind terms, predicate clause. Um, these appear to me to simply be non rigid. A de facto rigid predicator would be something which behaves, uh, this says designationally, but it should say predicationally, behaves predicationally as if it is de jure rigid, but isn't de jure rigid. So P would be a de facto rigid predicator if and only if P behaves predicationally as if it's de jure rigid, but is not. Where it takes to fulfill the predicate is not determined only by facts about the world of utterance, but it behaves as if this is the case. I'm not sure of any examples. I've given this talk a few times and people have thrown things out there and I've never really been satisfied with any of them. Um, so suggestions uh, by email, I suppose, given this talk is recorded, would be very welcome. Um, I think, ironically, I am not gonna have time to discuss rigidity at the time. So I'm gonna close here. Uh, I'd welcome any feedback or ideas. Uh, this is a relatively embryonic idea. Um, so yeah, please, uh, please get in touch if you have comments or questions. Thanks very much.